Well, howdy, 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 people. Good to see you all this morning. We got some business to attend to uh, as far as what God has for us today. So I'm going to open it up with a word of prayer. Let's do it together. Jesus, I I pray that above all things, um, our heart would be to know you more and uh, to know you more that we would then uh, kind of organize our lives around those things that draw us more into your presence and from that shape kind of our perspectives on the world, shape how we make investments into the lives of people and ultimately that we would do all of it for your glory. So I pray today that as we uh, look at some more of the habits that really mark what a follower in training looks like, uh, that you will take these ideas and, and kind of impress them on our hearts so that again we want more of you and more of those things because that is the route to really having more of you in our life. And so we look to you, we love you, and we thank you, Jesus, in your good and perfect name. Amen. All right, so uh, we are in this series, right, which is all about chasing greatness. And if there's anything that we know, if we just are simple observers of life, is that everything in life that's truly great, you have to lean into it in a pursuit, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you want to be a great athlete or a great musician or a great, you name it. There has to be this thing that says, you know what? It's not going to just be casual. I'm not going to just slip into being great. There has to be this concerted effort where you take certain habits and certain priorities and certain ethics and you kind of pull them all together. And from that you go, man, those are the things that I need to do to truly be great at whatever it is I'm seeking to be great in or with. And when it comes to the Christian life, the exact same thing rings true, right? If we want to really enjoy really take ownership of everything that Jesus intends for us, then there needs to be this thing in us where we go, man, then I want to go all in on that. I want to lean fully forward to enjoy everything that God has for me because I am a firm believer that the Christian experience is meant to be enjoyed. Not that everything about it is always enjoyable, not that it's always easy, but I am firmly convinced that Jesus came to give abundant life. Right? He says that in John chapter 10, verse 10. That's one of those life verses for me. Ever since I was a student in high school, when my youth pastor used that as the motto verse, it was like, man, I want to understand that and experience that more. But if we're going to experience this abundant life in Jesus, it means then we begin to pursue the greatness under certain habits that we should incorporate into our lives to then experience that. And that's what this little series is all about. It's finding those fit habits that we can live out. Now, one of the things we talk about as a church is that uh, every Christian is a fit person, a follower in training, right? And, and, and again, we're following after Jesus. We're not following after anything else. It's not me. It's not some Christian celebrity or whatever it is. It's, we're following after Jesus, and we want to mirror our lives after what we see in him. But to do that then means we need these habits. We need fit habits, Just like in your own physical fitness, for example, you have certain things you have to do. You have to eat these things and I'd eat those things and get up every day and walk or bicycle or run or go to the gym or whatever your your fit habit would be for physical fitness. In the same way, we need these spiritual disciplines, these features in our life to pursue, again, what Jesus has for us. So last week, we started this off by looking at the habits that are directly related to our relationship to God. And we said, okay, those are things like, you know what, we need to know God personally, right? That was just one of the key features in there, a habit that must be true to our life. And then from that, we want to be people that say, you know what, I want to take obedience and repentance seriously in my life. Because those are freeing words, right? Those are not shackling words. They're not shaming words. They're words of liberation. And so that's to be a feature in our life. And then from there we said, well, we also want to grow spiritually. And that is something that is to be a habit in our life where every day we're saying, Holy Spirit, write on my heart and my mind your heart and your mind, right? That's the essence of wanting to be truly spiritual in our lives. And then ultimately from that we said, hey, we need to have this sense of connection or pursuit of God daily. So we get into the Bible or we pray or we listen to podcasts or whatever it is, but we're just trying to saturate ourselves with these things that draw us closer into our relationship to God. So those fit habits are absolutely mission critical to the process. But today we're going to look at three habits 
And these habits are not so much about how I have a relationship with God, but rather how I take that relationship with God and I export it into the lives of those around me. So today is all about pursuing greatness, chasing greatness for Christians. And what I mean by that is how we can invest our lives into the lives of others. And when we make that investment, when we give ourselves away, we actually receive blessing and bonus in the giving. So really, the giving is also an opportunity for receiving. And so that's what we're trying to look at in this particular little nugget of our three-week series. And so uh, if you have our app, there's notes on there. And you can follow along today because we're going to be looking at just a handful of things that I think is really important for us to really develop and continue to grow in. Now, the one I want to start with is actually what we're doing right now, or at least part of it at least. It's the first thing in your notes, fit people, gather with one another faithfully. Fit people, they gather with one another faithfully. See, when Jesus came into the world, uh, he came as a missionary. Right? And he came as a missionary to rescue us from our brokenness and to rescue us into this abundant life that he promises. But, but when he did that, he didn't simply say, I'm going to come and I'm going to rescue the individual and it's just going to be a thing between me and them and nothing else. No, he says, I'm rescuing them from their brokenness, but I'm rescuing them into a community of my fullness and that community is his church. Right? In fact, Jesus even said it in Matthew 16, 18. He says, man, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Right? Jesus digs his church. Jesus is stoked about his church. Jesus is excited for his church. It's why he came into the world to start a church. It's why he rescues us and pulls us all together as a group because we are his church. He bled for his church, rose for his church, digs his church. And he wants us to dig his church as well. Now, Does that mean you have to go to church if you're a Christian? Well, you don't have to go to church, but it's no different than you don't have to go home to be married. You know, it's like you you can do it, but it's not the best. It's not the healthiest, right? The healthy thing is to say, man, I want to be engaged in his community because he is excited about the community that he is engaged in and with. And so if we're going to truly be followers in training, and we're truly going to grow in our spiritual development, that means we go, I'm going to prioritize then uh, when we come together on Sunday or when we come together in regroups or when we come together to serve in some capacity because those are all opportunity for us to be integrated together and to be the church. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, 10, there is this the section about the importance of us coming together. But I want to start earlier and kind of see the flow of the passage that leads us into why we want to make sure that this is a priority, that we protect our joining together as a church. So it starts in verse 19. The writer says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, Through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, dot, dot, dot. We're going to stop right there for now. Now, if you're looking at that passage, you go, what do I do with all that? I mean, there's a lot of weird images there, and it's a lot of Old Testament references, and it's things that people from a Jewish culture in their day would know exactly what this is stating. But we kind of look at this and go, what am I supposed to make out of this little nugget here? Well, here's the simplest way. If we just distilled it down, what the writer is starting with is saying, what Jesus did for us by giving himself on the cross created unprecedented access for us to come before God. Like before Jesus did that, it was laborious. There was all these stages and rituals. And even then you couldn't come as close as other people could that were more qualified than you. It was this whole crazy thing. And so the writer's saying, but man, because of what Jesus has done, we have this just unrestricted access. Even earlier in Hebrews, it says, even when we're messed up and broken, we have sin in our lives and we're just kind of just generally just a mess, we can still come to the throne with boldness and find grace and mercy in our time of need, right? That is the kind of access, right? So the writer says, Jesus has made a way for us to connect with God. Based on that, the writer says, here are three challenges that you should live out based on this access. The first is in verse 22. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. In other words, what he's saying is, because Jesus has given you access, 
take advantage of the access. Because you can draw near, draw near, right? It's like, it's like having a gym membership, right? Because you have a gym membership, you should go to the gym. If you have a gym membership and you don't go to the gym, why do you have the gym membership, right? It's kind of the idea. And in the same way, what he's saying is, man, you have this opportunity to connect with God in these deep ways because Jesus has made this access point. And so take advantage, press in, because here's what I find. When we as individuals um, make it our ambition to grow closer to God, not only does he graft his heart, not only is there a greater sense of his presence, but in that it causes you to look at life differently with this eternal perspective. It's, It's just genuinely healthy for the soul, right, to get close to God. And so the writer says, hey, because Jesus has done that, first step, Press in, go after it, get close to God, right? The second thing is he says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What he's saying here is if we claim that Jesus is the one that dominates our lives, gives us a vision for life, then let us really live like that. Right? If we claim him, well, then let's also really follow him. Let's hold fast, realizing that that's our true hope in life. So draw near, hold fast. Those are the things that, that we should all be doing. And I would say we should all be doing on a very regular basis. Because what we're doing when we do that is then we are prepping ourselves right, for the third let us that the writer talks about. He says, let us, from these other things, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So I'm going to stop right there for a second because I think this is really good. First of all, when he says, let us consider one another, what he's saying is, let us be preoccupied with the people around us, right? When he says it this way, he's saying, um, what every one of us should do is be concerned for everybody else around us. And particularly, we're concerned for their their spiritual growth, we're concerned for their their Christian health, we're concerned for their walk with Christ. Like we go, man, I'm really concerned, not like in a judgmental negative way, like, oh, I'm really concerned about her today, not like that, right? It's that thing that says, no, I, I really want you to be everything God wants you to be, right? Like that's the concern thing here. So he's saying, be truly concerned. So much so that you're trying to figure out how you can stir up the people around you. Which it's funny, that word in the original language that the writer writes in uh, means to agitate, right? Or to fire up, to instigate something boldly, or to inspire people. And so I love this because it gives me some direction on when we come together, how I should be coming to the whole, I should be thinking in terms of, man, I want everybody to be as excited about Jesus as I am. Or maybe I am struggling in my excitement, so I'm going to come and be honest about that. And maybe from that, I can be encouraged by other people. Whatever it might be, we're coming with that mindset and and model that says, man, I want to really put my life out there for others so that they can be encouraged to keep pressing on when times are tough, right? So every time we get together as a church on Sunday mornings or we're serving in some context or you go to your regroup, you should roll in like Pete Carroll, man, smacking gum and high-fiving and getting everybody fired up to go because, man, sometimes the Christian life is hard. Sometimes there are moments where we don't want to live it and we need somebody else reminding us that it's worth it. That's why when we all come together, we come prepared to do what? To stir up one another to love and good deeds, right? Keep loving people. Keep doing the right thing. Like, that's what we want to say to one another. Therefore, what this means is that it's not just we go to church, but we are to engage with one another as a church. We don't just simply sit and listen, but rather we're coming to leverage our lives for the betterment of others. It's not about spectating, but it's actually about spurring on. It's participation-based. And that's how we should look at it. We want to participate in the whole And it's something that needs to be protected. We have to kind of fight for it in our lives. In fact, the writer goes on to say, make sure you're getting together, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. See, this word neglect is interesting because sometimes we'll look at it and go, oh yeah, I've been neglecting church lately, or I've been neglecting my regroup lately, or whatever else. But what the writer's trying to get at is when, when we, quote, neglect it, what we're actually doing is neglecting others. That's what he's really trying to say. 
Matter of fact, uh, this word is sometimes translated as abandoned, right? So, so when we go, man, I got better things to do. I got a busy schedule. I can't really get together with my fellow Christians or whatever else. What we're literally doing is neglecting the other ones. We're abandoning them because what Jesus did when he put the church together is he made us really reliant on each other. Right? We truly need each other. And not always in the comfortable way. Sometimes the way we need each other is that we have certain biases or certain people we don't really appreciate as much or people we don't want to hang out with as much. And then we're put into this context where we have to, and that's good for us because I'm supposed to look out for others' interests and not just my own. It's not just my preferences that win, but rather Jesus wants to shape preferences in me that give myself away. And sometimes that's with people that are maybe difficult in my life. And so even that is something that grows me. But we don't want to neglect it. Rather, we want to pursue it, right? Because sometimes this neglect becomes a habit, right? And that's what the writer says, as is the habit of some. Just as there's fit habits, there's unfit habits too. And we want to guard ourselves against those unfit habits because it weakens us and it weakens those around us. So instead of neglect, what's he say? Encourage one another, right? Come prepared to do that, whether it's on Sunday, at a regroup, when you're serving together, whatever it is, that you come prepared to say, you know what, I want to touch the lives of the people around me. I want to do something, say something, participate in some way that's an encouragement. Now listen, here's what I know about all of this, this idea of of really fighting to make sure we meet together. Um, There's a lot of things that are going to contend for our affections. And there's a lot of things that are going to contend for our Sunday mornings or that night of the week that your regroup meets or whatever it is. Like I just, I know that that's true, right? There's going to be fun things, interesting things, even at times things that are good. I'm not going to try to say like they're bad things in any kind of context, but this idea of encouragement, stirring one another on, getting together, meeting up. It's a unique thing. It's a unique thing in the Christian experience, and that's why I keep saying it's something that we want to protect and and fight for. Because what I find is, uh, even when I read my Bible, and then I port that into just how I experience the church culture, one of the things I know, first of all, is uh, Jesus says when his church meets together, he meets with his church in a very unique kind of way. We see this even in Revelation 1, where Jesus literally kind of comes in among the presence of his church when it's gathered. And there is something about that. Like, just to be just totally candid this morning, I I woke up in a really dark mindset. I was just discouraged and just, it it was just woke up with it. I couldn't even give you like all these great answers, reasons, or it was just, just heavy. I was just really, really heavy. And it was heavy all morning, you know? But as soon as I got here and I started to see people and smiling faces, it's like the the clouds began to lift. And I believe that's a grace given by God when the church comes together. That It was just like, man, I, that's right, these people are in it too. And man, life can be hard and they're fighting it for, for you know, God's glory too. And man, what a great reminder. And so that's something that happens when the church comes together that's unique. I think that leads me to another thing about what's unique about us coming together. Uh, and that is, you know what, um, when you see hundreds of people that are all on the same Jesus page as you, it, it, it does inspire you. When you're in a community and you know that there are hundreds of people that go to the same church as you and, and they're, they're seeking to please God just like you, um, it can be that thing where you're like, man, I'm not alone. That's a, that's a huge blessing, right? That's a good thing. Another thing about coming together as a church I find is there are some things we do that are not downloadable, right? Like you can watch the message on the app or online or whatever else, but like the singing together, that's not a downloadable experience. That's just a unique thing, All right? Talking to each other in the comments, not downloadable. Being in a regroup, you can't download the content of a regroup because it's life being lived with one another. It's one of our values. We believe that life is best lived together, right? And, and so these are things that you have to come together for. And that's why the writer is saying, don't fall into the habit of neglect. Make sure you have the habit of pursuit and engaging in coming together. That's the first fit habit of the day. The second fit habit of the day is this. Fit people... They serve others willingly, right? They serve others willingly. In fact, again, you go back to Jesus. He's the man that kind of sets the tone. And there's this little nugget in Mark where he says, the son of man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in the same way that Jesus came to serve, he rescues us so that we in turn would serve just as he served, right? So the invitation to the good news of Jesus, the gospel, is come follow me. Great, where are we going? Well, I'm going to show you. We're going to this place where we serve the people around us because that's what he did. And if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Now, the serving, it is not to be seen as a mandate or a guilt trip, right? But rather, it's why we use the word willingly. We should want to pour our lives into the lives of others. Now, part of understanding this is a couple of things. First is this. uh, I would encourage us, when we think about this concept, uh, that we should not see ourselves as volunteers who donate their time or talents or treasures to God things, right? But rather, we see ourselves as serving others and serving them with our time, talents, and treasures, because it's not really our time, talents, and treasures, but it's God's stuff given to us, and then we're just kind of pouring it out into the lives of others. That's the spirit of what it means to truly serve in this way, right? Because when we do that, man, then we're really looking like Jesus. So again, we're not volunteers. We're fellow servants of one another. The other thing about this I think is cool is uh, every one of us is custom built to serve in a unique capacity, right? You have certain talents or gifts or abilities or whatever. You have a certain heart, certain interests, and you are wired by God to make that, that thing the way you serve. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, we see this unfold a little bit. It's interesting, in chapter 12, he starts off in a, in a place that you wouldn't normally think is about getting to servanthood, but, but this is where it goes. And so it starts in verse 1. He says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So it starts with this big, bold challenge, right? Live your life in such a way that your actions and attitudes and affections are a form of worship. Like, just do that, right? And, and part of the path to that is not letting your, your worldview be shaped by a worldview, but rather letting it be shaped by God's view of the world, right? So you're, you're having him really define you and shape you and work in you. Let that be the governing drive. That's kind of what Paul is getting at. But then he goes into verse 3, because again, there's a context to this. Why do I want my mind shaped differently? Why do I want to be a living sacrifice? Well, he says, because of the privilege and authority that God has given to me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has its special function, so it is with the body of Christ. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. So this is what's interesting to me about this. If you just kind of keep it all laced together, he says, uh, give your bodies this worship. Uh, Have your thinking reshaped so that you can see yourself clearly. And in seeing yourself clearly, then you can invest yourself into others more accurately or boldly. And that's why he starts to get into the body. So he's like, okay, it's really easy for all of us to kind of be selfish and self-interested and self-seeking. I do it. I'm excellent at it. But he says, you know what? When you let me shape your mind, Matt, then you start to realize it's not about what you like or don't like, what you're comfortable or uncomfortable with, what you want and don't want, but rather it's how you can do good into the lives of others, how you can serve them. From this, he goes into all the different ways that we might be able to serve. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. If God has given you the ability to prophesy or to speak, speak with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If it's teaching, we'll teach them well. If it's encouraging, man, be an encouraging person. That's awesome. If it's about giving generously, well, then give generously. If you're a leader, man, take it seriously. If you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And I think if Paul had more paper, we would have kept writing other things, right? There's tons of things, right, that we all have a capacity to do. Everybody has something, so do your something for everybody, right? That's, that's the essence of this. And I love that, right, because this is how we work together as the church. And we're to do it with the tone that's embedded into this, right? 
It isn't just, oh, you're good at this, we'll do it with a scowl. No, there's a sense of when you do it, man, do it with heart. Do it with enthusiasm, do it with joy. In fact, this is where he goes in verse 9. He says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. He says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. This is why I said earlier, we're not volunteers, right? But rather, we're thinking in terms of I'm serving the people around me, right? I'm loving them. I'm giving honor to them. I'm showing hospitality to them. That's why we as followers in training want to serve because it's being like Jesus and it builds up the people around us. And so we take all the opportunity we can to be those servants in the way that God has handcrafted us to be those servants. Fit people serve others willingly. And I think one of the ways we can do that, I mean, there's a lot of ways, But one of the ways that's kind of in our fit model here is the third and final kind of habit that we should have, which is fit people invest their money generously, right? We use the resources that God has given to pour it into the lives of others or things that benefit others. Now, originally, when we first rolled this out a couple of years ago, our Built Not Born series, we've done it in a micro kind of thing a couple of times since then. But when we originally rolled this out, this point was different. This point was actually that fit people give their money generously. And it's sort of evolved because I started to think about more. And I'm like, it's true. I mean, we give, but, but that's not the full picture of what the Bible presents. There's more than just giving in the equation. The word investing is far superior because when you start to read through the Bible, you realize it's not like, okay, I give my money and there is no dividend paid for the money given. No, when you read the Bible, you see when we give, it's actually an investment for greater things and it has a return on investment for our lives in fact in first timothy chapter six here's how it starts off paul writes as for the rich in this present age charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on god who richly provides us with everything to enjoy i start there and i just want to highlight a couple of things first of all if uh, you live in this country you are rich I am rich. We are rich. We may go, I'm not rich. Maybe not by our American standards. We go like Warren Buffett, that dude's rich, right? But by all other global standards, by all historic standards, all of us are rich. We really are. And and so we kind of look at this text and we go, man, this, this pertains to me. Now, because it pertains to me, what's it tell me? It says, well, Matt, don't, don't be, don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant about what you have or how much you make or what your nest egg is or your security because what we also know is that these things can evaporate quickly, right? If we go, man, money is going to rescue me, you're trusting a a real precarious savior, right? Because we know stock market can crash, something bad can happen, you can lose your job, any number of things can happen. So so money is, is a tool, but, but it should never be an idol, right? It, it's not going to truly rescue. It can be helpful, but it's not going to truly rescue. So we set our hope on God. What I also like about this passage, though, is that it's not anti-money and it's not anti-wealth, right? What's he say? Put our hope on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In other words, if you have, if you're comfortable, if you have money, let's say you're even wealthy, wealthy, like you're wealthy even by American standards, right? God isn't going, wow, the rich people are lesser. It's the poor people that I like the most. No, what he's saying is, man, that's great that you have it. That's great that you possess a a, a large sum of whatever it might be. He's like, enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's good. But enjoy it as a tool because money is a great tool for doing things, right? Don't trust it, but enjoy it. What's the best way to enjoy it? That's what Paul says next. Tell the rich, right, in this present age to not be haughty. Don't put your faith in money, but rather they are to do good. To be rich in good works, to be generous, and to be ready to share. Here's a crazy thing. Uh, Starting in a couple days is Christmas season. October 1st, right? So... (laughs) It's just the way it works, man. 
Honestly, like I, I had to swing into Walmart last week and they're already busting it out there. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, right? It's September, but October 1, Christmas season starts, right? And what's gonna happen between October 1 and Christmas is kids and grandkids and whatever else are gonna come with their Christmas lists, right? I want this and this and this. And what are we gonna say constantly? It's better to give than to receive, right? Well, here's God talking to his big kids and he's saying to us, you know what's awesome about money? You can give it. It's better to give than to receive. What's cool about money is you can do cool stuff with it that invests into the lives of people, that invests into the lives of the kingdom. What's he say here? Ways that you can do good. You can be rich in good works. You can go over the top and how you really care about other people by using this tool to bless in some capacity. Man, that's the heart behind this whole thing. Right? So that's what we want to be prepared for with our wealth. We can also enjoy it. Go on trips, buy fun things, do cool stuff. That's awesome. But one of the best things is we get to give it away. There's this scene in 2 Corinthians where Paul is writing about this handful of churches in a region called Macedonia. And he says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And so here's what he's saying here. Here's this group of dirt poor people. There is a state-sponsored embargo on the marketplace that forbids them from selling goods, right? And so they are destitute. They are destitute. But when they hear there's an opportunity to help some other Christians in a church someplace, they're like, take my money. You know, you don't have any money. Well, what do I have? Take it. And I love this because it says they were begging earnestly for the favor. Do me a favor. Take my money. It's amazing to me. Right? Because we sometimes look and go, man, I can't afford to do this. Well, I guarantee they couldn't afford to do this, but they were so excited they did what little they could. And God's like, man, that's, that's generosity. Now, why did they do this? Well, I think, one, the Holy Spirit had laid it on their hearts. I think that's true. But the other thing that I think is true is that they bought into the idea that when we give, it's not really giving, it's investing. I go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, the rich, what are they to do? They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. See, right there you see it's an investment. And it's an investment in different ways. One, it's just an investment into literally the future, right? In other words, when we read the Bible, we see that there is this new earth. And on this new earth, there's cities and gardens and, uh, you know, there's, there's parks and there's an infrastructure and all of that. And somehow, how we handle the funds that God gives us in this life, how we invest those for kingdom purposes, that then has a payoff in the next one. I don't understand the economy of heaven and earth. I don't understand how it all works. I just know that that's what's repeatedly said. You store up in heaven by giving it away. So it's not really giving it, it's investing it with a better return on investment, right? And so I, I believe the Corinthian church owned that. They're like, you know what? Our life's gonna end eventually and one day we're gonna go into this next one and we wanna be investing for that next one. That's one part of it. I think the other part is when we do this, we're investing into others around us. Like for example, when you give to Redemption Church, you, you, you make this investment here and then you're encouraging other people and you're making other things possible either for our community or for our membership or our people that go to Redemption here, whatever it is. There's just all kinds of ways that you are pouring it in to bless others. But then I also would say that it's also blessing you because when we make this investment, Part of this is saying, you know what, money is a tool, but it doesn't have my heart, right? Money is a tool, but it isn't my savior. Money is a tool uh, that I can use, but it's not something that possesses me. I think that's part of what the giving process does. And so we seek to give generously. These are just the habits of what it means to be a follower in training. So with that all said, I kind of give a challenge before us today which is when we look at these different habits, whether it was the four from last week or the three that we've looked at today, what are those things where you feel like God's saying, all right, this is where I want you to lean in a little bit more. 
right? Maybe it's just gathering together. You're like, man, we haven't gotten in a regroup, and maybe that's what it is. Or we neglect a lot of Sundays, and maybe we need to make that a bigger priority. Maybe that's the area where you feel like God's calling you to lean in more. Maybe it's the serving. Maybe you're like, man, we haven't been serving for a while. I haven't really served in any capacity, and maybe that's where God's calling you to lean in. Or maybe it's in the giving of money, just the generosity side, where you go, we, just, we don't invest maybe into the eternal things like we know we could and we should, and maybe that's where the Holy Spirit is working on you. I don't know what it is, but again, I go back to what the series is all about. I understand that really to pursue the greatness that Christ talks about, it's chase, right? It takes concerted effort. It takes focus. Nobody just falls into these things, but rather they're to be pursued and they're to be pursued with the strength that Christ gives. Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, I thank you for just reminders. Thank you for reminders like in my world, um, your church is a place of encouragement, even for me today to come in and just, like I said, just feel a sense of camaraderie and love these people and know that they love me and that was enough to kind of push away some of those dark clouds. I thank you that you have wired us to need one another. I thank you that you've wired us to serve one another. I thank you that you've wired us to give, really, to one another. And so I pray that we would take your habits seriously, not out of guilt or shame or fear, but rather because we want the very things you promise. We want the abundant life that you offer. And so we ask that you would work and work mightily among us in your good and awesome name. Amen.